Sailing, it's all about the open sea, the wind through your hair and the world at your mast. It almost sounds like a Mills and Boone novel. Well, I'm about to take the plunge as a first time sailor, so join me and the crew as we get to the bottom of this ocean odyssey. So Sandy, here we are, uh, cruising at sea. It's um, as flat as a tack, sunny as. Do the conditions get much better than this? I can't think of any better conditions, it's perfect. So what is it that attracts people to sailing? You know, we've got no noise, just the, the water lapping on the side of the boat. It's just pleasant. Lapping it up can come at a cost though, especially on a top of the range luxury Catalina like this one. What sort of value are we talking about? 250000 So you're telling me that I've got a quarter of a million dollars at my hands? You certainly do. No pressure at Enjoying all. Enjoying it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we haven't crashed yet, so... <laughs> Beginner's luck perhaps, but smooth sailing isn't hard if you know the basics. It's quite easy and don't be intimidated by all the ropes around. It's uh, just getting to know what rope does what. You would do a drive if you want to go in the direction of the wind. And straighten up now. And that was a drive. And uh, how do you think I'm going so far? You're doing a fantastic <laughs> job. <laughs> Ten minutes and you're right. <laughs> well, next time we'll ask the big question, does size really matter? When it comes to sailing, that is. Big may be beautiful, but good things can also come in small packages. We'll show you why next week. On any given Wednesday night during summer, while most people are winding down from the daily grind, boating enthusiasts are unwinding and winding their winches here at North Haven for a spell of twilight sailing with the Cruising Yacht Club. So before the sun goes down, let's find out what all the fuss is about. For a way to break up the traditional go, go, working go, go, go. week, try this. It's a weekend on a Wednesday. You get stressed on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, no matter what people say to you, you come sailing and they can't hurt you. It might not be the Sydney Hobart yacht race, but twilight sailing is a midweek competition tradition for about 400 yachting fanatics off North Haven. About 40 yachts of all shapes and sizes take part on an average Wednesday, and with handicaps involved, no boat's too big or too small, but it helps to be well placed. It's a great way to learn and it's a good, good atmosphere and at the end of the day everyone has fun and you know, people win when they win. And if they lose, they can blame the uh, people that do the handicapping. And while most take a relaxed approach to the racing, socialising is quite another matter entirely. I look forward to it because um, we know lots of people down here and it's just fun seeing people and being out there. But there is one catch, a post-sale drink or ten and a bite to eat here at the Cruising Yacht Club's headquarters is customary, so I've got to wander off and do some serious research. But if you've liked what you've seen and want to join the crew, give the Cruising Yacht Club a buzz on 8248 4222. And go out and get a bit wet and have a bit of fun and join your friends and then have a lovely dinner afterwards. Ow, 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 ow! Here we go! get stressed again Thursday, Friday and you go sailing again on Saturday. That's what it's all about. To come down, bring up the club, make an appointment, see if you can get on a boat.
used to own them on our hull, but when we got this boat, um, we never looked back. When it comes to sailing, some like to go solo, but for others, it's double or nothing. We're talking hulls, and the question is mono or multi? And if you hadn't already guessed, it's a multiple choice. We had it built for racing, primarily, um, but we, we didn't spare on any of the cruising comforts. We wanted everything inside, and um, she does both beautifully. We can take the family away, and, um, but at the same time, we can do our Wednesday twilight racing with great success. Well, I guess one of the biggest advantages would be the fact that you're always sailing flat, never having to sail on your ear. When you retreat to the cabin, it's like walking into a TARDIS. A catamaran of this size can comfortably sleep about eight people. Of course, if you're the last to struggle back on board, there's always the couch. From anyone that comes from a monohull background, the first thing that usually surprises them is that we've got a, a wall oven, and which doesn't have to gimbal. So. Uh, you know, it can be fixed in one location because the boat doesn't lean, the oven's always going to stay flat and you're never going to spill anything out of it. Today is probably around about three hundred and eighty to four hundred thousand dollars. You can start at a fourteen-foot Hobie cap, um, costing around about three, four thousand dollars. So, uh, yeah, if anyone wants to break into catamaran sailing, they can definitely start at that on the, off, off the beach level and um, move up into something like this. So while traditionalists maintain there's more than one reason to stick with mono holes, others insist the benefits are far multiplied on board multi holes. So why not wander down to the cruising yacht club and give both a try? My advice for mono hole sailors is to step up into a multi. Well, over the past 12 episodes, we've looked at various disciplines of sailing from single hulls to multi-hulls, and we've always come to the same conclusion. Sailing is for everyone, regardless of shape or size, and you don't even have to own a boat. Boat owners need crews to get moving and to provide some movable ballast. There are usually a few vacancies around the clubs, and you don't have to be experienced to get a berth. Adelaide's fabulous coastline provides an idyllic location for sailing and newcomers are welcome, so don't be afraid to venture in and ask for a ride. Yeah, if they've got a couple of million dollars and can afford to buy a boat, they can come down and join. Of course not. It's, uh, all they need to do is ring the office and uh, make, you know, indicate that they're interested in coming down. The CYC's twilight sailing every Wednesday evening during summer is a great starting point if you're after the larger boats and other clubs often have come and try sessions. I've done it again, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> so what's it like for a first timer? Paramedic Stuart Banks gave the Catalina a test drive. So Stuart, you're a first time sailor like me. How's your maiden voyage going? Um, good, I'm trying to concentrate on where we're going, which is, it's pretty hard at times, but I'm really enjoying it. It seems uh, very relaxing. Basically, it's been kept uh, fairly simple and probably the best way for me, I think, and just doing bits at a time, and the instruction's been very good, yeah. And age is certainly no barrier to sailing. Kids can start training as young as eight, and as long as you're able-bodied, you can keep on cruising right into the twilight years. From such humble beginnings, your life can sail off in a whole new direction. I'd learnt the basics of sailing, and then uh, I came down for a twilight sail and got on a boat, and now I've raced competitively more all around the world. Some sailing clubs specialise in training for youngsters, offering well-supervised sessions and experienced crews in safe, stable yachts. Now, join. When you get there with the boy, you join. Let your jib out. And there are even specially equipped yachts for budding sailors with disabilities. Excellent. It was really good fun. Yeah, it was really easy and it was really quite relaxing, actually. So there you have it, everyone's on an even keel when it comes to learning the ropes of sailing. Thanks for joining me on this ocean odyssey, I've certainly enjoyed my voyage and can't wait to get back out on the water. And if you'd like to do the same, contact your local sailing club. You need to come back? Um, I don't know, it depends on what my wife says. <laughs> <laughs>
If he sells his bikes and his cars, he can buy a boat and we'll all go out. Well, it's so well sailing the Catalina that just a few weeks later, here I am at the helm of a $150 million Navy ship. I can you believe they've left me in command? I sure hope they're insured. When HMAS Diamantina and HMAS Huon recently graced our port, I received the call up to help the crew get things moving. Set course at 210. Theoretically, what happens if these commands are incorrect? It's alright, you say uh, disregard commands. Select auto. Come again. Select auto. Select auto. Select auto. It has a uh, variable depth sonar and two mine disposal vehicles, as well as a uh, fully fitted uh, diving team. At just 50 metres in length and with under 40 crew members, they are the pocket rockets of the sea. The Italian designed vessels are propelled by a 2,000 horsepower main engine with an average cruising speed of 15 knots. It's uh, not that fast, but um, when you're mine hunting, you don't want to go too fast anyway. So. And while they're not built for speed, they are designed for quick handling and going the distance. When we're in APUs, it's very easy to turn, it comes around very fast, we just turn on one spot. Very good to handle, except in rough seas, it's pretty bad. <laughs> The ship carries 50,000 litres and can give, get us from Sydney to Perth without refuelling. Both ships are equipped with state-of-the-art technology because when it comes to mine hunting, there are no second chances. And the mines are only you know, a lot more sophisticated nowadays. They can lie on the seabed, they can do ship count, so they can wait for the third ship to go over it and then they'll blow up. So they're a very sophisticated threat. Next week we'll take an in-depth look at just how these ships go about the risky business of mine hunting. If you like heavy metal, you'll love HMAS Menorah. Weighing in at more than 8,500 tonnes and measuring almost 160 metres in length, this is one massive chunk of military muscle. The Navy Warhorse docked in Adelaide recently to show just how it measures up and the city has a lot to do with it. And then the actual name Manura comes from a small country town about uh, 100 k's to the north of Adelaide in the Clare Valley. Which... The ship is originally uh, came from the United States Navy as a, as a tank carrying vessel. Bow thrust to starboard, step two. Roger. And the, uh, the Royal Australian Navy bought two of these vessels ourselves and the Canimbla, and uh, we converted them in the mid 90s. And it was quite the extreme makeover. HMAS Menorah has been fitted out with a helicopter hangar and a specialised crane, giving it the capability to transport military forces from ship to shore. Approximately 400 Army personnel on board, or obviously Air Force is required, and four. Four Blackhawks, Seahawks, and obviously two landing craft is that capacity we can take them ashore. So they're very versatile ship, and certainly in the short time that the Australian Defence Forces had them, they've always been the first ship of choice to uh, send off to any operation. And that was the case in 2003 when HMAS Menorah was deployed to help restore law and order in the Solomon Islands. Carpan, uh, this is Menorah. Thanks very much for your assistance today. And while the ship's tours of duty are impressive, the captain also gave our crew quite the round trip. Come up to 90% uh, and uh, start doing some uh, hard turns to uh, port and starboard. Now we've been doing some serious turning circles and donuts. What is this ship capable of? With all six engines online, we can get about 21 knots. Typically, when we're transiting on four engines, we'll do about 17 knots. For a large ship, it handles exceptionally well, very handy. It's now around 24,000 horsepower. It's more than your average Holden, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's about 200 times your average Holden. And uh, yeah, it'll turn inside a frigate, so yeah, it's a good fun ship to drive.
we've got some brim fishing planned today in the Todd River just north of Port Lincoln and a good day on the brim always starts right here on the sand flats early morning around low tide pumping bait. Now we're after some saltwater yabbies or clickers as they're better known. Brim absolutely love them. You can catch brim on a wide variety of baits but live clickers are definitely number one. Well this is what Todd River brim are all about Tom. About a three pound fish. Now they do get bigger in here but that's a magnificent brim. Doesn't matter where you catch that in South Australia or Australia for that matter. And it's a nice mullow. This is about a five, six kilo mullow. Nice fish. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Happy? Yeah. I'm happy. I am, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody happy. This morning I'm at Point Drummond on Lower Air Peninsula just north of Coffin Bay. I'm with Tom Tierney and his brother Terry. This is going to be our starting point for what should be quite an exciting day's fishing. We're going to fish the rocks in several different locations and target things like sweep, maybe salmon, mullet, big tommies, King George whiting. We don't really know what to expect but this is a beautiful part of South Australia so come along with us and see exactly what we can catch. It's a double header of sweep. There's not a lot of natural ground in Spencer Gulf, but down here off Port Lincoln there are a few offshore reefs that hold good populations of snapper. They hold them because the reefs are covered in scallops and other smaller shellfish that the snapper like to feed on. And by locating that ground on the echo sounder, put yourself in the strike zone for snapper. So that's exactly what we've done this morning. What's that? What snapper fishing is all about. Well done, mate. Okay. Oh, nice fish, about three kilos, three and a half kilos. Well, here's the first big hook up for the.